Winston, you, you ready? I'm ready. All right. I want to thank all of you for joining me once again. This is Gaines Domain. You know, we're talking about subjects significant and trivial with the same intensity and feeling. Um, we're going to talk tonight. I'm going to start off by talking about a series we're going to start, which is how to develop your ability to hear and listen to music. Uh, I think that for many years, me and the great seer of the American vernacular, Phil Schaap, argued about the, very, the importance of music appreciation. We tend to spend a lot of time with musicians talking about music, and we forget about the general audience of listeners. So I'm going to go through 16 steps of hearing over the time. I'm going to be announcing when it is, and I'm just going to talk about the levels of hearing from when you first start hearing music so as you deepen your understanding of uh, music and you're able to understand more and more things till I get to a, a very, very high level of hearing. And it, some of it comes from uh, things that we all know from studying music and even what we like and we listen to. But also it comes from the many different experiences I've had with great musicians uh, from the beginning. I can always remember hearing when I was a kid the story of Ben Webster, the great balladeer on the tenor saxophone. He was playing a beautiful ballad, and in the middle of it, he stopped. And everybody said, what's wrong, Ben? His nickname was Frog. He said, what's wrong, Frog? He said, I forgot the words. So because he could not put the, the melodic notes in the, in the emotional context of the words, he felt it was time to stop. I can remember doing a lecture with the great Reginald Veal on the bass, who grew up in the, in the in Afro-American church tradition. And he explained with his bass, what things mean in a, in a church service. So he started to play, this is the offering, this is the, this, this, this is uh, the recessional, this is that. And then he started to do a juke and like a funk bass line. He said, what do that have to do with service? So he connected us to the fact that music has meaning. I can remember the great Yakub Badi, master drummer from Ghana, laughing, saying that you Americans made a big mistake when you failed to realize that drums have meaning and rhythms have meaning and a sound has the meaning. He was always talking about that. And it takes me back also to when I was going to the tango when I was in a trumpet lesson and one of my teachers asked me, we were working on Mahler Third Symphony. Then he asked, he asked me about the solo and I was playing it. And he said, it was, it's called a post horn solo. And he said, what is a post horn? And I, I was trying to figure out something and lie and try to you know, just come up with something to make myself seem knowledgeable. And he said, it's just exactly what it says. Somebody delivering mail and they play, they call this, this the sound of the trumpet across dale and valley. And uh, it has to be played with that feeling. So if you, many times, if you don't know the meaning of something, it's very, very diff difficult to hear it and to know what it is. Also, uh, from the, the whole presence of rattlers and shakers in music across time, and when those shakers and rattlers are used to call out the Holy Spirit, these are just different things. The music means different things at different times. In New Orleans music, the tradition of the trombone being the instrument that signals you're going to start a, 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 a jazz funeral. And uh, Jelly Roll Martin on a Dead Man Blues, in the beginning, he's just joking around. He says, I think I hear that trombone form. Uh, I, I think I hear that trombone form blowing. So he's letting us know uh, what, the, what the traditions are. So we're gonna start, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the, the levels of hearing from just hearing music as a sound experience, which means like how you hear film score, just as dynamics and textures and moods, to finally understanding the meanings of music in the context of national and global history and uh, connecting things and trying to understand where they, where they, where they fit in on the timeline. Um, that's that's where, where I'm gonna be at coming up. But I think tonight, because we've had so many good conversations and telling stories and stuff. Of course, we can always go back to our storytelling. I want to thank all my guests just last week uh, with, with Dee Dee and Chick. It was so informative and beautiful to hear them just tell stories and many things uh, I, know, I know none of us knew. We're going to get back to that. But I think tonight I just want to hear from you all. It's been a month since we started, and we started with uh, 10 things to do during this, during this time that we are, uh, that we are quarantined. And um, we feel very different now, a month later, and we're going to feel very different a month from now, uh, because this this is a very interesting this is a very interesting period. So uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna open it up to whatever questions you all have, and if I if I can say anything that will help or, or alleviate some confusion, maybe some of the things I, I say will add to confusion 
If it does, I apologize. And uh, I will do the best I can to be as forthcoming and direct as possible. So, Adam. Great. Thanks, Winton. Um, cool. Looks like our first question is from Hugo Dart. Um, Hugo, go ahead. Hi. Uh, hello, Winton. It's uh, a real privilege to be able to speak uh, with you again. And this uh, series of uh, uh, conversations uh, is just amazing, and I appreciate the opportunity. Now, we're talking about listening, and uh, I guess for many of us non-musicians, how we listen to music depends a lot on, on the media, on how we have access. And I've been fortunate enough to actually attend a few concerts at Jazz at Lincoln Center and from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, but I've been able to, to, to make it there a few times. But for many of us, it's through the media, and of course, TV is mass media. So I recall this interview you gave some years ago about how televised jazz can be very important, but, uh, and I quote, it has to be on our terms because many times musicians want to when it's not on our terms and then it's best not to do it. Now, there have been some very interesting examples of jazz on television and uh, with the ones that really come to mind are the, the Ken Burns uh, series Jazz, of which you participated in. I learned so much from you in that series. Then there was the, the Treme show that had everybody from Fats Domino to John Baptiste. Uh, now, of course, we've been able to see on CBS Sunday morning. So these may be interesting examples of musicians being on TV on their own terms, I guess. Do you feel that's uh, better now? Do you think that it's easier for, for musicians to really reach the, the, the public and educate the public about the music on their own terms on television? Is that easier today? Uh, is it easier because you have the option of doing that online now? Well, I think I think uh, thank you for your question. I think it's if you if you want to be educated in there, I think you can go online and you can. There's a lot of information. So, and that way, I've said before that I love the fact that so much information is online. Uh, but I think that it should be it should be something that we learn in school. Music appreciation. Music is a very important art. It teaches us so many things, and it's difficult to have a three minute television slot slot every now and then, and educate. Uh, a general public in a very complex, though simple subject. Um, I think many times when you when you appear on TV, if you're trying to play something, the question of the producers is always, do you sing something? Can you play something fast? Like, can it be over quick? Or can you play something slow? Like, is a singer going to sing a so, slow ballad so we don't have to hear all those notes? Uh, can you can you can you not play? Can you talk about something? And I think that we have a long way to go with that. And in terms of our culture, we've devalued music a certain way as an art, as it has come to the forefront as a way to sell products. Now, I'm not against us selling products. It's always a matter of balance. Once, once something as deep as music becomes only a product connected to everything but adolescent passion, everything from adolescent passion to, to toothpaste, it's not something to decry. But it's, I think that it's, it's important for us to understand that the art of music is very serious. And a national music has a lot of things that you need to teach your nation. One question I always ask younger musicians, not, not, not a, a general population, when I meet them after gigs is, can you name five American folk songs? I'm, I'm speaking of gigs in America. The answer is almost always no. And... Uh, it's just part of the failure of our education system. And while I, while I say, yes, we have failed at these things, it doesn't mean I believe we're gonna to continue to fail, but I believe we have to point out kind of things and, and try to work on it. You said you're from Rio de Janeiro. So an example of that is the kind of cross rhythms and, and styles we share, like a bayao. My bayao has the same feeling of the New Orleans habanero that we play in parades or foro mm -hmm. from, uh, musicians in the military who would throw dances and they would say the dance was for all and people in Brazil would say for all. So the music has many connections and when we see them and hear them we start to say okay oh yeah I see what that is oh yeah I understand that and the one rhythm I find just to give you a little information about music that we can hear all over the world is for some reason that rhythm which we call habanera it's called the kind of Indian an Indian parade beat in New Orleans. It's in a lot of Pakistani music, a lot of African music, 
it's the bayon and, and the and the Brazilian music. It's a uh, what is it called in 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 uh, in, in, uh, in tango? I'm remember when I've stopped talking, but this rhythm has a lot of uh, of connection. So, yeah, I think I don't know if TV. I think you can go online and get good information, mm -hmm. but in terms of commercial television, as your way of getting that type of information, I'm not that hopeful for that. Right. Thank you. So, thank you. Sorry for that long answer, little brother. No, I appreciate it. I like your Brooklyn Bridge background. I took the picture myself. I'm very proud of it. It's a nice picture. I'm a sure. Thanks, Hugo. <laughs> yeah, you're right, man. All right. The next question is from Kevin Stevens. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Good evening. How's it going? All right. How are you feeling? Excellent. You know, by way of distant connection, I was in marching band with Kenny Rapton back, Rampton back in college. All right. Um, I've heard you say on a couple of occasions that when you're a player, you should bring out what your instrument does best. And I've been trying to figure that out for the vibraphone. I'm an amateur vibe player. And I haven't come up with a good answer for what the vibraphone does best. I'm curious both what you think that answer is, and then as a, like a sort of a sub question, when you're listening, do you like listening to two mallet or four mallet players, or do you care? Okay, first, I don't, I don't know whether they're playing two or four mallets, so I don't, I don't really care. If I'm looking at them, I can tell. I think uh, the more mallets, they can get that real soft, pretty sound and play chords. And I, I love all the instruments, you know, and, and I feel like when I think about, uh, when I think about the, uh, the, the, the playing on the vibraphone, it's, it can be a very sexy instrument. It can be very beautiful, like, 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 like the way it's played with Milt Jackson and the uh, modern jazz quartet. It can be a very powerful instrument played with a lot of fire and heat, like the way Stephon Harris plays it. It can be played with tremendous, uh, tremendous energy and it can play up and down the registers and, and be very percussive, like the way the young Joe Ross plays. It can be, um, it's so many things. It's in the percussion, it's in the percussion family. It's a great highlight instrument. It's also like, like, a, like a piano, but just the ringing. It rings, it's soft. It can be played with softer mallets and have a very etheric sound. It can create a very pointed kind of uh, aggressive sound. It can it can create a kind of hazy patina of sound that sound it, it makes you feel like you you you're in a daze. It's an instrument that's tremendously versatile, and so many people have played it so well uh, for such a long time that that I, I really love that instrument. I, I need to study it more, but I, I like to use it sometimes in orchestration for colors. And there are many vibe players that I've loved uh, love their playing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Um, all right. Next question is from uh, Robert Brablook. Robert, go ahead. Thank you, Adam. Hello, Mr. Marsalis. How are you? All right. How are you feeling? I'm doing all right. Um, in the very first episode of Skeins, you said uh, this. use this as a time to get to know the people that you think you know. <laughs> and that resonated with me. I, th I thought it was a profound statement because it, it really it really is that time, right? Uh, you have the opportunity and we all have the opportunity tonight to speak to you and, and get to know you a little bit more. And I, I really, I think I speak for everybody in the sense that we appreciate it very much. And uh, my condolences on your father uh, passing. You. And uh, speaking of listening, we should know that he's listening, right? And he's listening in tonight and, and, and enjoying this uh, the same as all of us. Um, the, the question of, of listening and, and the perception of listening, uh, at faster tempos, the perception of the eighth note is that in swing music is that it straightens out a little bit. At slower tempos, how are you perceiving that eighth note feel? Are you thinking in, in triplets? Where are you thinking the accent? Uh, where does it become a shuffle versus a swing? Hmm. How are you perceiving that eighth note swing rhythm at slower tempos? You know, that's a good question because it's, it's, it's something that uh, when, we, when we tend to think of, talk about the innovations of Charlie Parker, we always talk about uh, the harmonics. He played the upper harmonics as if musicians before 1940 didn't play 11s and 13s and sharp 90 seconds and they played all of those things. I think it's a question of the African six and four. 
So if you start with that. You can see a derivation of the four feeling against the six feel. And if you go look, listen to drummers like Billy Higgins would follow you in the ride pattern. Somebody like Connie K would play really a really tight swing. Ting, 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 ting. Almost like something you wouldn't think would swing, but it did. And I think each musician has a different way they interpret that eight no feel. If you think about if you're playing on a really fast tempo, one thing Dizzy told me was to make sure if you really have something that's really fast, tap your feet on the downbeats. But if you think about we're not going, we're not playing straight 16. It's like shuffling. We're also not going, like, that's kind of like the way the musicians did before Charlie Parker. A good example of that is uh, Johnny Hodges is playing on Duke Ellington's Giddy, Giddy Bug Gallop. So I tend to be very loose with my interpretation of that shuffle pattern and that triplet. I had an exercise I would do where I would go. I, I would just take beat. It's good for music. Just go. So you go sixteen note rest, eight note rest, triplet rest. So you start to feel how the beat moves inside of a beat. Um, I don't want to be too technical about it when I'm playing or when I'm listening because I can't enjoy it. But I just want to do these things enough so that I feel the time naturally. So I know, I know when I was growing up in my trumpet lessons, sometimes we would have these military trumpet exercises in our album book. And my teacher would always say, understand the difference in trumpet between a one, two, three, four, four, titi, titi, and the 16th note is different from the triplet and also something like something like the Hindemith Sonata has that it goes from triplets to 16 notes um, in jazz you know you have to hear the larger unit the faster you go the more you have to hear inside of the larger unit so if you're going to like what Dizzy was telling me you want to play a larger unit now Let's also remember that when you swing, larger the swing falls in an eight note pattern. So if you're swinging, so it's falling in a natural eight feel. And, and uh, so I've practiced a lot learning different shuffles. I would try to play like that shuffle the way Sweets Edison played it. I try to play like the 60 note the way Dizzy would feel it or with Miles would feel it or Clifford Brown and try to find my own way of phrasing all those things at one time. Uh, I did a record a long time ago called The Magic Hour. And then that, in that, uh, on that piece, it goes from four or five different sections. I work with different shuffles. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but I try to be open in my hearing of it. And if you take somebody like Art Blakey, he could play a shuffle by just playing quarter notes. So, so the band would go, and he wouldn't have any triplet. He'd be going, uh, 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 ting, He starts smiling. Boy, who would play that? He play that quarter note for, he may have played ten minutes. Ting, 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 and just the way he was placing it, you could feel ta, a ta, a ta, a ta, a tu, a tu, a tu. When you looked at him, he was like, boy, you know, I'm swinging up in there tonight. So, you know, there are many ways to to feel these, to feel these feel these beats, but understand that it all comes from the six, four tension in African music, the three versus the two, the, the, the male, female energy going against each other, the positive and negative. It's a, it's a thing that exists, yin and yang, it just exists in the world. It's how do you ride the wave between those tensions. Thank you so much, Mr. Marsalis, I appreciate it. Thank you, little brother. Thank you, Robert. I'm gonna tell Kenny. <laughs> All right. Um, next question is from William Schwartzman. William, go ahead. 
Um, hello, Mr. Marcellus. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, right. um, um, so I've noticed for me personally, I'm improvising, especially over a tune that I keep playing over and over again, and I sort of, uh, you know, put it in my repertoire. I begin to develop habits during my solos, um, and they start to sink into my muscle muscle memory. Um, and over time, uh, I'm a piano player. My hands sort of feel like attracted to those certain, <laughs> and it's almost like magnets, you know. Uh, and I was wondering your thoughts on how to fix this issue, if it, if it you know, if, if it even is a big issue and just your general thoughts on this topic of habitual playing while soloing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's a good question. How old are you? I'm 15. You know, man, if you're 15, I think, um, great. You know, tape yourself, play a lot, notice the things you like about your playing and the things you don't like about your playing. Listen to other musicians. And I'm going I'm to challenge you to listen a layer below licks or harmony. And I want you to try to figure out what the musician's objectives are when they play. You're 15, that's old enough to think about it. How is that person, what is their harmonic concept? What is their, their concept of melody? And I want you to think when you listen to them, what are they trying to do when they play a solo? How, what, what do you notice about the way they develop form, the way they make harmonic choices? So go from the surface of it, which is where you're saying about your own playing, you have licks that your fingers fall into. And I want you to get a layer beneath, beneath that, which is instead of what licks they're playing, what are they, how are they trying to make an audience feel? I'm gonna give you an example. If, you, if, if I ask you to write an essay about what it feels like to be quarantined, and you say, okay, I'm gonna tell you everything about how it feels to me to be quarantined. Okay, then you write down all of what you think about it. But what if I, if I ask you that, and then you look at me and say, well, how do you want to feel when I write this piece? You see, I want you to incorporate. I feel like I'm playing the same stuff over and over again. He said, well, man, if you don't play something that's the same, nobody will know it's you. And then he sang a lick that Charlie Parker played all the time. He said, when you heard that, you knew it was Bird. So I'm not telling you play cliches. Can, you can pick through what I'm, what I'm telling you to hear what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Okay, so one, study yourself. Figure out what your objectives are. Change those objectives to include more creativity. Another thing to do when you're practicing songs, play them in different keys. <laughs> Once you get it, go a half step up or a half step below, and I'll guarantee you your fingers are not gonna fall on the same thing. All right, Tr try that. Thank you so much, Mr. Marcel. Right. That means well, a lot. I look, hey man, I look forward to hearing you play sometime once we get back out here. Thank you. Come back and let me hear you do your thing. Thank you Thanks, so much. William. All right. All right, next up is Kira Peppers. Sure, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Marsalis. All right, how you doing? I'm okay. How are you? All right, I'm good. Good, um, thank you. I am a music teacher in the South Bronx, and uh, <laughs> I teach, I teach <laughs> fourth grade, um, but I teach through the lens of jazz. So everything that we study is somehow related in some way, shape, or form to jazz. And um, before the quarantine, we were studying Duke Ellington, and my second through fourth graders were studying Satin Doll. And before that, we did Duke's Place, and they had a really good time. Um, so my, my question for you is, well, because now that it's kind of difficult to teach music online, um, I, they have me doing like Instagram Lives and things like that, but I have to do some lesson planning and unit planning for next year, and my fourth unit for fourth grade and third grade is on the Marsalis family. No, so, no. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> let me apologize to you. <laughs> it's it's all it's all good. It's all good. My my, I think it was either last year or my 
second or, or the year before that, um, we had a picture of you in the classroom and the kids loved it. They always said hi to Mr. Marcellus. So <laughs> <Like Yeah. Broadway. laughs> tell them to keep that graffiti off of my yeah. picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell them next time not to draw such a thin mustache. <laughs> But um, no, they, they liked it. They really dug it. I mean, they're very, they're very interested in whatever and however I present it to them. They really love it. And so last year when I took, no, I t yeah, last year when I took um, a uh, piano course at Juilliard in the evening, I, whatever I learned there, I would bring it back to them. They really enjoyed it. So I guess my question is to you, is just like, what would you want children to know about developing or listening out for harmony? And what would them, what would you want them to know, I guess, coming from you and, and your heart as a musician for five-year-olds to 10-year-olds? Well, first I want to say that I absolutely love you. Oh, um, thank you. I mean, you. You're doing God's work. You know, when, I, when <laughs> I, yeah, I'm telling you, I went to, been to so many schools. Uh, and uh -huh. when, I, when I get to that age of what you're teaching, the kids are so beautiful and so much of what they learn is from your feeling. Yeah. So yeah. your kids are unbelievably lucky to have you as a teacher. Oh, thank you. Uh, just by the kind of love and feeling you have. I knew, I know that if I would have come to your classroom, I would love to do it, the feeling of it. Yeah. I tend to think that, you know, a complicated thing like harmony is best to make it simple. Mm -hmm. So give them songs that are easy to sing harmonies to. Okay. And have them sing the harmonies so they don't even know they're doing it until you tell them. Yeah. I like, if I have two voices, start with two, then add three. I always like to start with just the blues. Okay. And give them, give them the, the simplest kind of hymns. I, I, I love that hymn and those American folk songs. Mm. And you're in the South Bronx, so you want to get some stuff from that Afro-Latin tradition. Yeah, oh yeah, they love that. You know, you got to get, get in the, in the and there's also very uh, basic fundamental songs that everybody sings and knows. It's, and it's, it's great for them to learn that. And then after you've taught them and they're singing mm -hmm. in harmony, then you tell them, hey, this is harmony. Because okay. harmony is vertical and it's horizontal. Yeah. So I would tend to teach them just the, the a part that they don't, like people in church sing in harmony. Mm -hmm. We don't know about saying sing in harmony, y'all. They just start to find a note a fifth away or something. Right, right. And uh, modal music is good, like things like spirituals, mm -hmm. very basic fundamental material that people have already sung harmonies on. Mm -hmm. Don't make it mysterious. Right. And then I think also, you know, it's interesting it, about harmony is that it's a thing that you can be, uh, it, it's, it's such an accompanying thing that you can be the main voice and then you mm -hmm. can go far in the background. I would teach them just that rudimentary, rudimentary harmony on songs like Little Lives of Jane. And with that yeah. age, I believe in keeping it moving. Like mm -hmm. even if I was on Instagram, I would have them singing, hey, we're going to learn these five or six songs and always that enthusiasm. And no matter how bad it is, to keep repeating it. <laughs> yeah. You know, after a year, they're going to get it. But I would yeah. always be, you know, this is great. Well, let's try the second part. Let's sing this. Mm -hmm. And let's do this. And, and I think everything, you know, singing and tapping out rhythms. So that's kind of how I would deal with it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. That helps. But, you know, write to, write to me and get in touch with I'm going to try to come to your school when we get out of that. Oh, that's we really would love do. that, Mr. Marsalis. The kids would, would, would love, love it. it. I'm going to bring Thank Carlos you. with me. He's from the South Bronx. We do that kind of stuff as a hobby. Oh, and Henriquez? No, he is the man, yeah. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll bring Carlos, bring Poppy with me. We'll get out there. <laughs> <laughs> You're always welcome. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you, Kara. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good luck with your kids. <laughs> All right, next question is from Pradyumna Manat. Go ahead. Pradyumna, are you there? I'm having trouble hearing you, but you, you look, I see you got oh, your- Yeah, there you are. Can you, you hear me? Working. Okay. Hi, Mr. Marcellus, how are you? How you doing, little brother? It's a great honor to meet you. I'm here in India okay. and I studied from the late Madhav Chari, who's still oh, man, that's my man. Yeah, he, used to, he used to talk about you and your father all the time. So oh, I man. learned like I learned many things indirectly from you and your father. Um, <laughs> and this is a great honor to, to be here. Uh, my question is that um, being over here so far away from uh, the USA and trying to be able to sound like a jazz musician. I think I have to work a lot to understand how to create uh, melodies in my improvisation because it's like another language. And 
And then when we transcribed, I get confused as to what do I really do with the transcribing because I don't know how to translate that into my own creative playing very mm. effectively. So, and how can I create stronger melodies that speak jazz and not something else was my question. <laughs> okay, first, thank you for, for, for calling in. I want to say first about Madhiv. Madhiv Chari, the great Madhiv Chari was my absolute man, man. I love Madhiv. So I'm going to tie what you say, are saying into conversations Madhiv and I had. Madhiv passed away. We went once to Queens. He was in New York to see a, a, a concert of traditional Indian music from South India. But Madhiv was counting out forms for me. And then he would say, okay, you tell me where, where it is. Man, I would start counting the forms up. I never knew where it was. So sometimes the people would go, ooh. I would say, what are they doing? Ooh about it. It wasn't anything fast. He would say, you can't hear that? I'd be like, no, man, I have no idea what they're playing. And he said, <laughs> you have a lot of work to do. You know how Marty was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Marty didn't miss <laughs> words. And so I yeah. was always trying to learn, you know, Indian music from Marty. And how can I hear this form or how can I do this? The most difficult thing to hear is the meaning of events in other people's culture. Right. Man. You know, somebody plays fast, yeah, something happened. But when in this in this concert, just something would happen and everybody in the audience, and I knew the audience was good because it was all older people. And um I think that let's let's break apart what you're saying. First, let's let's look at the fact that now jazz is an international language and musicians have learned how to play that language all over the world. We can go back to the great Django Reinhardt. So European Gypsy could play the way he played with as much authority as any jazz soloist that was playing. So right. it's something he did to figure that out. And it's kind of like you got to look at it like when people found, when, when, the Rosetta Stone, when the Rosetta Stone was found, now we can make comparative analysis to translate these ancient languages. And look at where we are now with hieroglyphics. Look at where we are, not from that, but look at where we are now, not, not from the Rosetta Stone. Look at where we are with cuneiform. We tend to, to, to break problems apart. So you're talking about melodic language. Start from the very basic melodies, the spirituals, the hymns, things that are the foundation of a certain type of Western uh, melody. And then figure out what is the relationship that has to Indian melodies that you know. Because all of these things are related, just some are, are tangential. Uh, like when we did something with the group from Pakistan, it was interesting. They were counting like 238 bars of a form. And we yeah. think they count 238 bars, but then you think about kind of the, the nature of, of, of Indian mathematicians or of the whole kind of superiority of chess or the kind of spatial way that they can work all the way that Madhav was counting forms out. Man, it was so complex, but for him, it was fundamental. So I think find those things that, you, that we have in common while you study the thing, the melodies you want to learn and do a translation. Translate from what you know to what you don't know. And, and fill in the gaps and uh, don't abandon all of what you know to learn what every, somebody else figured out because you're going to find a lot of common ground. Look for that common ground. Uh, one thing in, in, that we have in common is a kind of playing uh, scales and figures on top of a drone. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. I think I would always know to say, because if you think even the most complex tune, tunes have bridges, on some level it's a drone. Even something like giant step, you giant steps, you're going back and forth from whole tone scales. Right. So I would try to perceive that scale of relationship, and I would try to study anybody who worked in that field of Indian music and jazz in a serious way. And then the last thing I would say is I don't I wouldn't I would not transcribe by writing notes down. I would use my ears to transcribe and try yeah. to figure out once again, like I was telling my little young brother that was 15 try to figure out what things mean when people are playing it and try to think of what feeling do I evoke when I play these things. And I think that uh, if you're systematic in your understanding and always start with what you like and what you know, it's always best to start with forms of music you like and forms of music that you know and start from there and start to spread your education out from there. And you're gonna find a lot, just the fact that you knew Marty alone because you know how serious he was. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. Man, I loved him, man. <laughs> I loved to just hear him talk and tell me how I couldn't play and why. <laughs> but about it was something, man. So you know, start from that beauty. feeling he had. Yeah, yeah. 
he was intense and and he would tell me about how intense you were to him he told me if he would call you would ask him how many hours he was practicing <laughs> i would mess with him man <laughs> i would be messing because he was so hard on me we would be taking turns see who could be hardest on each other you know <laughs> i loved him man people didn't understand him all the time because you know you could yeah. you could get modded to laugh too i would joke with him a lot too yeah absolutely <laughs> The great Madhav Chari, man, you made me feel good just to hear his name tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a great honor to talk to you. It's my honor. So, you know, learn them things by ear. And, you know, we'll talk again, man. I'll see you. But don't feel divorced from any traditions. At this point, the traditions all belong to the world. If you feel right. you have to be in New York to play jazz, you don't understand the history of jazz. People playing good everywhere. Tete Montalou, study him. Dado Moroni, he could play. You know, it doesn't matter where, where you come from. Ego Bootman, the Duzo Makatini, South Africa. You take your pick. There's people playing great everywhere. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. All take right. Care. Thank you. All right. Next question is from Sean Pao. Okay. Just need to... Hello, how are you doing? Go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so we've met a handful of times over the years after a few concerts that I've been to of yours and uh, I've enjoyed listening to your music for about 30 years. Uh, the question I had was, I'm, I'm curious, how accurately do musicians play during live concerts when you're at the level of playing with a great band like Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra? And in terms of like accuracy of, of playing the arrangements, right? And, and not so much in terms of like improvising, because you know, with like improvising, you could be playing wrong notes more, more so than, uh, you know, or just making poor choices, right? As opposed to wrong notes. But, you know, is it a case where musicians make mistakes very infre infrequently? Like, you know, like I missed a 30 second note last year in a song, or is it much more often than you think it's just, just it's, you know, well, we miss, you know, we, 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 we joke with each other about, about parts, but we don't really think about it. We assume we're going to play most of it right. But I had an operation on my lips like, man, I don't know, the year 2000, I don't know, 2006, something. And it took me a good eight to 10 years to really, I had a new homage, a new air player. So I would literally be on gigs. Sometimes I would miss notes that I never, ever missed. And even now, when I get above that G, I'm not as accurate as I was. So Ryan and I, we've been playing 20 years. Ryan Kaz is just next to me. He can go, I mean, we've heard him go a week without missing a single note. So at one point, he looked at me, he said, man, that, that operation must have been serious. <laughs> I said, man, <laughs> I'm struggling just to get through parts. And we all go through periods. Sometimes there's a lot of little spiders up on the bandstand. But we're trying to play always accurately. But that's our objective more is to play together and to touch people. I'm gonna leave you with one story of the great Marcus Belgrave. We had the pleasure of playing a section, section with him and we laugh about it even now on the bandstand. Whenever you would mess a part up, he would laugh and he would say, you're playing with a lot of expression tonight. So if you really messed a part up, he would say, so much expression, so much expression. <laughs> and that's kind of, we still, we still say it on the bandstand, if you really mess a part up, it's more funny to us, we laugh about it because we we've been playing together for a long time and we we're trying to be accurate but we're not robots we're human beings and nobody looks at you and says nothing when you mess a part up we have we have another saying that ali jackson used to always go when you mess a part up it's just hey man we're still playing music we're not assessing whether you play perfect or not and uh we have a very relaxed feeling on our bandstand like we know we know we're trying to do the best that we can but sometimes things don't work out appreciate it thank you Yes. Thanks, Sean. All right. Next. Uh, but I also want to say one thing. That when you miss parts, you get teased now. If you really mess up a part, you're going to definitely have to be ready to say, man, what, what's going on back there? You know, they're going to they definitely tease you and mess with you. <laughs> All right. Next question is from Jim Drost. Hey, Jim. Jim, go ahead. Hey, man, what's going on? How you it's doing, good, man? Good, good to see you, man. Good to I hear you. Good to hear you and see you, man. We can't wait. Had to cancel uh, a couple of trips. Chris and me back to New York. Uh, man, got to see you guys soon. I have, first of all, I think 
2004 was your operation. Uh, because <laughs> 2005, you missed uh, Newport Jazz Festival. And we were there, and Victor Goines was leading the, the band. But you were there in 2005 because you played with Dave Brubeck. Uh, and we were there that. both years. That's right. We played Take the A Train. I remember that gig. That's right. Uh, but speaking uh, right along the listening aspect about the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, I know you are so humble, but I want an honest answer here. Has a any band, I mean, I'm, I go back to the 60s to Shiko Akiyoshi, you know, Akiyoshi Lou Tobacco, uh, you know, Ted Jones, Mel Lewis, Buddy Rich, Harry James, Duke, Count, all of them. Has anyone ever done what your band does now, which is the repertoire? almost on a weekly basis, you can go from Coltrane to Willie Nelson and everything in between. And also all the arrangers in the band. I mean, has any band that you know of ever done this? I don't think so. With the arrangers, I don't think so. But I'm not gonna brag on us, you know I mean? I'm just saying, I'm just, <laughs> that's what my vocal, my father would always say, man, you know, well, well, I think, I think we, you know, we have a lot of firepower, you know, and I always say to people every day when we play, the hardest part of my job is really fig figuring out how we can access all the talent we have. Sometimes, because Elliot Mason is, is playing third trombone, he'll be the last soloist. And we all say this, now it's not just me. So when he starts to play some fantastic solo he's playing, everybody better look around and say, oh yeah, him. <laughs> so we, you know, we get to that. Another thing I want to just say about the band is because the, everybody solos and wants to play, sometimes you get to the second or last tune and you, you, you're looking around to see who hasn't played. Now, everyone in the band is looking around and saying, so-and-so didn't play, let's open up space for this one. Uh, so yeah, I think, you know, the band, we stayed together long enough and we have, uh, we have leadership, like the, the older of us, we, we're proud of it, like what we've played. And, and we don't like to admit to that because, you know, bands, we tend to have like a kind of dysfunction and a kind of, but with Ted and I and Victor, we've been, we've been there a long time. We say, you know, okay, we, 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 we've gotten to something. I mean, we, and our younger members are, you know, Chris Crenshaw and Carlos counts as a younger member, even though he's been there for a longer time. They are so great to work with and easy to work with. They're such great musicians. They're we, of Ted and Vic, and us, when we do a show like Chris Crenshaw's, show he did of the 50s. Ted and I actually had tears in our eyes after we played the last note of his music because we thought, man, this, this guy wrote all this unbelievable music and this arrangement is so intelligent and clear and so well written and so attentive to detail. And it, it made us full of uh, uh, Carlos's job he did a group of, with the Ruben Blades concert where he wrote 14 arrangements of all different styles. And you got to remember, we've seen them since they were 18 and 15 and 14. So you know, and then, then when you get to our really younger musicians like Camille Thurman, or, yeah, we're just proud to, to we have a blues we're getting ready to, to, to put out that we all worked on in the first week of the, uh, of the quarantine. And Camille wrote her chorus and gave us all kind of impossible trumpets to play. But we looked at her arrangement and we were proud of what she did. So it's, it's a thing where, you know, yeah, we, 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 we have a vibe. We know that we've done a, done a lot of music on a certain level and we're always trying to get better. And we are very discerning about the level, and we want we want to get better and play on a higher level every time. Well, you guys are great. And uh, by the way, one of my favorite arrangements, I think Tane might have done it, but on your autumn, le uh, autumn leaves, you talk about the-, the <laughs> That's right. right. That's Tane's, yeah. We go yeah. one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, right, That's, right. That, that was swinging. Tane. Yeah, Tane is something, man. I'll just leave you with this, though, please. And, and you know, you guys are the best. Uh, you got to get Ken Burns to do a, a, a documentary, a PBS on your band. And just, I think people would find it not only uh, entertaining, but educational as to what goes into all these different arrangements across all these genres of music. I think people would find it fascinating. Ken well, Burns would do a knockoff yeah. job. I appreciate you saying that. But Ken is working on maybe 15 things right now. If you know the, the work that Ken does and his energy and Jeff Ward, just that they work that way is so inspirational for me. Ken is a little older than me. They are, they have so many projects and they work constantly. So I gotta just, just hearing his name has made me tired. And he never gets tired. So uh, thank you, thank you, man, it's good to see you. Same here, man, take care. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, much love, man. Thanks, Jim.
You ready? All right. Next question is from Frank Barrett. Frank, Hi, go ahead. How you doing, Frank? Good, man. Um, thanks for doing this. It's really, I look forward to it all day, and we all need things to look forward to at the moment, don't we? Man, you know, you know it. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. And I wanted to say something about the session you did a couple of weeks ago about your dad, which was really lovely. The one thing that we didn't get to talk about much is what an incredible piano player he was. Um, I'm a pianist, so I, I noticed m most people may not know that he didn't make piano his main instrument until he was in his early 20s. And he had to really deliberately learn and teach himself how to play. And one thing he does that a good piano player will notice is he never used this sustain pedal. That's the lazy man's way of getting legato. And your dad played the most beautiful legato without ever using a sustain pedal. That takes an incredible amount of discipline. So I just wanted to lay that out there. Um, you win. Um, one question I have is, um, I, I know in, in uh, some interviews you've mentioned your dislike of rap music. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that in light of what you say about the power of drums. Well, the first thing is, what I'm talking about is the use of little words that have become come, come common out here. For somebody my age who grew up in the civil rights movement and was integrated into schools and had to deal with like a certain type of pressure of that, we don't want to see that come out here and be in our mainstream as this is what we are. It's just like all those movies about pimps in the 1970s. You know, my mama hated all of that. But yet and still, that became the mythology. That mythology won, y'all pimps. Now it's the, the abuse of, of, of people. You know, I saw, I saw a, a, a cover of the Rolling Stone magazine with three ladies on the cover of it. And it, 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 the, the article is called Women Shaping Our Future. And the, the, the cover made me so mad. Not at them, but because the editor would do that to them of a, of a magazine and put a picture like that. And the kind of use of these words, I'm not even gonna waste my time. I've said it a million times since the 1980s. I will never go along with that. So far as the creativity of the musicians, hey, human beings are creative. I don't care what you call a form, people are going to be creative in it. They're gonna come up with new things. They're gonna invent things. And there's a tremendous amount of creativity focused on hip hop. My specific thing with it is, I can't use the, the uh, making fun of black people, making our pathology, something about our neighborhood be a safari for people in the suburbs to go on, celebrating gangsterism and all that. I'm just, I'm not ever going to be a fan of it. I wasn't in 1988 and I'm not now and I never will be. And if that makes people mad, I don't care. Somebody's got to be at a certain point an adult and not just go with cheap populism. So as far as that, that's what I've continued to say. In terms of drums, you know, I mean, it's not too many people playing drums in. I, I would like to see a lot of great drummers, a lot of machines playing drums, a lot of beats being programmed, some of which are very creative. But like the great Yakub Adi used to tell me, what about the sound of a drum? A drum has a very heavy sound and something very specific. And what we see is the kind of kings of drums like Max Roach, like Elvin Jones, like the list goes on and on, man. You take your pick of any race, Buddy Rich, uh, uh, Mel Lewis, uh, uh, Art Blakey, Tony Williams. I could name drummer after drummer after drummer. That level of drums is not being played. So mm -hmm. once you once you let levels go out of the window and once you say, well, this is the new thing, then you don't have to know the Constitution to be a politician. Then you don't have to know medicine to be a doctor. Then you don't have to. So I'm not, I'm not really a populist on that level. I'm not just going with the group because they're saying it. And one thing I want to say I learned from my father in the civil rights movement was that when everybody was like in that racial thing, he just wasn't a part of that. And he would take an unpopular point of view and he stuck with it. Even though there was no TV camera or nobody talking to him, it would be only black people there. And he had his way he looked at stuff that was against the prevalent view and he espoused it. And uh, you know, that's what I do. I don't want to get sidetracked with misinformation about my viewpoint on it. Because when you do things and you say things in the media, they're looking to create they're looking to, to, to create a, a, a story. It's like, it's like, and people in your country can be dying, a media figure is more interested in critiquing your president than it is helping people with scientific information. You know, mm -hmm. I'm an artist, I'm, I'm not a politician, so I don't have to, uh, uh, I don't have to 
relate to any one constituent or another. And this, this permeates our way of life. I remember once talking to a friend of mine on Fox News, and once again, I'm not speaking right or left, because it's, it's a hustle anywhere you go. Uh, but this was a friend of mine, we went to high school together, and we played in a band. So I'm thinking we're gonna talk about being in a band and you know, playing an experience. We had one night of dropping out, playing the national anthem at a basketball game, people start booing us. You know, it went into some, some ridiculousness about, about some lightweight barbershop level politics that he was trying to get me, drag me through. And I'm not coming at these subjects from a, from a political standpoint. I'm, mm. I have my point of view that may fall one way or other, but I'm, I'm coming more from a human standpoint. So mm. when I comment on this, on this, on the cover of this, this magazine, I'm coming from it like if I were them, would I want to be portrayed like that? Or, or are they happy with that? Or some, some adult, some person in their mid 40s made the decision to put them out here like this. And I think that when we fall asleep as a, as a culture and a society and we lose a, a human contact with people to go with hip hop or black or white, or when we allow whatever our misconception of people based on our misconceived concept of race or, or, or ethnicity or class, once we allow those things to dominate our conversation, we can no longer speak in a granular nuanced way that is a hallmark of the intelligent. Then we just out in the street cussing and hollering and screaming at each other, which, you know, it can be fun to do that, but it's not a na it's not a national agenda and it's not fun on the national state stage. Mm -hmm. That's right. that's kind of long answer, but that's what I think about it. Thank you. Great to see you, man. Good. I like your beard. You know, you're growing yeah. it in. I might let my silk. I might let my snow come out too. You're inspiring me. Thanks. Nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> I like that snow, man. You're looking good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. Um, great. Next question is coming from Josh Mizrucci. Josh, go ahead. Marshallis, uh, I'm Mr. Marshallis. It's great, great to be here. Uh, I'm really enjoying hearing your thoughts on all kinds of different things, and uh, uh, really enjoying hearing everybody's questions as well. Uh, my question is actually um, regarding to when you're learning new songs, uh, particularly in the small group uh, jazz uh, genre, but also in the large ensemble. Um, do you have a particular process you like to use when uh, you're learning a new song? Um, and because I know we all have our, our kind of approaches to it and there's a lot of uh, different ways. And I know uh, sometimes, you know, when I'm playing hanging with other musicians, we don't always get to talk about all that, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Thank you for your question. I tend to go from the broadest understanding to the most specific. So first I want to know when was it written? Who wrote it? What is it trying to say? What tradition does it come out of? How can I fulfill it? What is the accurate melody? Uh, what is the what is the what in the largest sense? Who wrote around that time? What consciousness or kind of understanding does it come out of? Then I go into more musical things. What are the exact notes of the melody and what is the bass? How can I look at the melody and the bass as the same thing? What are the, how do the harmonies, what is the harmonic conception? Like why does it modulate to this key and what does it go to there? And how can I approach the harmony through XXX? How are we gonna play variations on it? And then I go through a thematic breakdown of the melody. Like if this is a kind of A theme and this is a B theme, then it goes up a half step, the B theme reverses place with the A theme, and then there's a new C theme at this point in it. So then I go into the kind of granular understanding of it. Then I try to just sing bass lines on the song and get the feeling of the harmonic progression uh, in my ear. And, and after that, I start to try to play the melody while, and hum the bass note. Boom, beep, 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 boom, beep, 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 boom, beep, 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 boom. Spell out the chords from a, uh, uh, arpeggiate it, arpeggiate the chords, then put extra notes in it, like flat nine, flat 13, raise, just so I can hear it. And then I start to just play melodies on it and try to play melodies based on the melody that was written. So in that way, if I'm studying a song, I try to take it apart and learn it from the broadest to the most specific. So I hope that helps you. That's an amazing answer. That I, that's a, uh, some stuff I never thought about it, especially playing melodies over the, uh, over the song of your own. That, that's a really, Amazing insight. Thank yeah, you. Based, based on the melodic information of the song. So based you can begin to continue. play your solo as an extension, as if, what if I were continuing to write this tune, what would I write? Yeah, yeah. 
I never thought about that. It's really cool. All right. Good luck with everything. Thank Handle you. your business. No Thanks problem. Question, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Next question is from Stephen Warren. Stephen, go ahead. Hey, Wynn. How you been? All right, now. You happening? feeling good? Oh, this is my own boy. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Man, get this guy off here. We went to high school together. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> What's going on, man? <laughs> oh, just staying at home, trying to be safe. Is uh, everyone in the orchestra doing well? Yeah, man, we all doing good. We, we got to call tomorrow. It's good to see you. Y'all all right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Ethan yeah. just finished practicing, and Sharice is uh, doing schoolwork for her class. Yeah, Everything's man. good. Much love. Yeah, likewise. So, <laughs> um, you know, music has different feelings when it's live and when it's not live. And one of the things I really enjoy is when you're live in New York and I can watch it live here. <laughs> Even though it's through the internet and uh, I'm not there, it's still really good. And uh, do you think there's a difference in whether it actually is live or just record it live and you're listening to it? You know, yeah, there's a difference. It's like me and you are talking across this, uh, the phone. Well, you, 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 my, you my humble. Y'all don't know him, but he's one of the most soulfulest human beings on earth. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's always been crazy. Since we were in high school, he was like that. Like mm. that kind of timing, you know? So is it the same if me and you, you know, we, we, we looking at each other talking? No, man. You know, but this, this is what we have for right now. So, you know, I could see you as much better than if I was on the phone with you, I saw you. So right. I had that same feeling like if we were, if we were together with each other. And yeah, it's a big difference between it being live, but how many concerts have I heard on recording? Let's think of all the great musicians that are dead. You're never gonna see them live. And their music is still unbelievably right. impactful. It's still wonderful. It's still, it's still great. So we don't, have to, we don't have to choose. For right now, we have to choose. But you can believe me, you're gonna be, be sitting around a bowl of gumbo before this all is over, we're going to be talking about this very conversation. Well, so, you know. look at the video that I've got of my camera. Uh -huh. This is a typical night of me dancing to you. <laughs> Wait, don't show that. Now you're messing up your profile. <laughs> I know. I didn't suck my gut in. <laughs> but you can see, I just love listening to your music, picking out, <laughs> dancing in the kitchen. What could you say that? You know, you're doing your thing. And you'll show that to everybody. That's what I love more than anything. It's like I'm in high school again. You know, well, I'm, I'm glad you're it. doing well. And I really love these uh, Monday night skeins domain. Thanks, man. Uh, last week was exceptional. Uh, and just seeing you and listening to you is just such a treat always because your, your heart and your sense of humor is always there. You know, and you've got to bite your tongue and hold it back sometimes because, you know, you're... You know, we're in public, man. Come on. You, well, you've been, you know, you've been around. You've been around the world a few times. And, uh, it's a cool thing. Man, come on. But, yeah, man. I love you, and I'll uh, talk to you soon. Man, give my love to your, to your people, to everybody, man. It's good to hear from you. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question is coming from Coretta Lemu. Greta, go ahead. All right, now. All right. How are you doing, Mr. Marsalis? All right, now. How are you doing, Coretta? I'm doing great. This is my birthday, and I'm spending it another uh, April with you. Um, we have been spending a lot of Aprils on concerts and, and different things, and I'm glad to spend another one, not with Lincoln Center as close as I can. Um, and I wanted to say thank you, um, basically, for not being a hemorrhoid. Many times we meet our um, people that we admire, and they just turn into hemorrhoids. And that's really, that's really sad. And I wanted to tell you, I, I don't expect you to remember it, but a couple of uh, Aprils ago, my sister baked uh, cupcakes for the um, for the crew, Mr. Uh, Boss Murphy. Boss Murphy. Boss Murphy asked us to, so we baked uh, 28 
dozen. I remember that. I remember. Twenty-eight dozen cupcakes, three different that. flavors. I remember. So we, weren't, so we weren't sure you were gonna get it, but you know we baked it so everybody can have some, and she's a great baker, so she did, and. <laughs> We weren't um, we weren't able to see you after the show, so boss said, "Well, go upstairs to the million dollar ball." And so we <laughs> went upstairs. So we uh, got in the room as a room full of, I guess, millionaires. And so we went, well, not we went in the side door. We got in, and it was like when you're in a room with people, it's like ants on candy. I mean, everybody is surrounding you and on you. And so we're like, okay. Then we got, uh, someone asked us, uh, well, they came to tell us that this was the millionaire's ball and we didn't, we didn't belong there. So that we can go downstairs and uh, listen to some free music. And so we understand, you know, we will make your money. So we decided that we were gonna just leave. We understood. And then we going up to the elevator, we heard this voice say, come back, where you going? Um, what you want? And so we turned around and it was you standing there asking us to come back into the ball. And you told my sister that we had just as much right to be there as anybody. And I thought, you know what? You didn't have to do that. You were there for a reason. And we really appreciated that because you're not a respected person, which I appreciate knowing that. Um, so I really, you know, that's one of those stories you tell while you're alive. Um, that we really, you know, you do a lot of nice stuff. I've been backstage enough to see, and I've been to 15 concerts since 2009. So um, I really, in, we really enjoy the music. My sister enjoys the music. And, you know, we tell Boss Murphy after all, all the concerts that y'all did wonderful, you did great, and that we really appreciate what you do. Well, first, I like, I like just hearing that, I like hearing that southern voice. I, we just appreciate what y'all, I love that. So, <laughs> happy birthday. And you know what else? A lot of times, even if you go to the, the, the upstairs ball, now the people who are there many times, as people I know, and, and they just soulful too. They, they don't want people out of it necessarily. Things are set up a certain way. And it's not a, I remember, you know, I remember, I remember them cupcakes, I'm gonna tell you that. <laughs> and you know, Boss Murphy, he carry, he walks around with soul in his pocket. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm glad you came. I appreciate you uh, calling. I wish I had my trumpet and could play, but a lot of times there's other people telling people you can't do this, you can't do that. The actual people who are there are not like that. And uh, for me, I don't, I, I actually like to be around people, but for, on behalf of a lot of people who are uncomfortable around other people, I, I, I learned over the years just everybody is not a, uh, sometimes people are nervous. Like you might take somebody who's playing before a gig and they're really nervous about their gig and somebody will come to them and talk to them and they're so nervous they just can't. And some people are uncomfortable with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're stuck up or they think they're better than people. That's very seldom the case. It's mm -hmm. just that they, they're uncomfortable, you know, and it's, it's, it's not their thing. With me, you know, I'm comfortable with people that I meet. I'm comfortable dapping them, but, but it's just part of being Southern. I have a lot of brothers that, in, in that way, you know, it, it's, it's not a, it's not really that much of much of a struggle for me, but I empathize with people who, who are or in the public who talk to people who see people and might just have a thing, and that, that thing is does not always come from an air of superiority. So that's mm -hmm. all I want to say. What you said, but I do appreciate you writing in, and I wish I had. I was looking around for see if my horn was right around in my station, but it's not. I wanted to play a little happy birthday for you. So the oh, next time, sweet. your birthday. Next time, I'm gonna do it for you, and and, and thank you so much. And You're welcome. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Coretta. My horn is Coretta. I like that name, Coretta. Coretta. All right. So we've got time for just one more question this session. Um, but oh, as we wind down, I'd like to just remind everybody about all the live events we'll be continuing to host. Um, we have question and answer sessions with Winton and special guests, master classes and conversations with members of the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra, live performances streamed from artists' homes, free education classes, and more. Um, 
We also just premiered our gala concert last Wednesday, the 15th. It's called the Worldwide Concert for Our Culture, and it can be found on YouTube, Facebook, and at jazz.org slash gala2020. So be sure to check that out if you haven't. And let's get to our last question. Our last question is coming from Catherine. I don't see a last name from you, Catherine, but I'll unmute you now if you can hear us. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, go ahead. We can hear you. I have a great story that I have to tell. In 2012, you came to Louisville, Kentucky, and I told my father, I said, Daddy, Wood Marcellus is coming to Louisville. And he got so excited and he paid for the tickets. I was going to pay for the tickets, but he paid for the tickets. And he was 95 years old then, 95 years old. And he was so afraid that he wouldn't be able to get in and get out. And I remember specifically um, getting a seat right by the door, just in case he had to go to the bathroom. He could go out, in and out <laughs> without, uh, uh, without um, you know, problem, disturbing yeah. anyone. Anyway, he came and he enjoyed it so much. He goes, oh yeah, that's a trumpet player from New Orleans. And see, my father's from Plaquemines Parish. Uh oh, watch out. He really appreciates this. So this is, what, this is what I was going to tell you. When I heard about your father, I said to my father, my father died in 2015. But anyway, if he were alive, he'd be 103 right now. But anyway, I said to my father, I said, Daddy, Ellis Marcellus is up there. You have to go say hi. <laughs> <laughs> and the way I like to think about it is that they're up there playing cards, drinking whiskey, telling lies, and talking <laughs> about us. And I just had to tell you that I had to. I, I had to. <laughs> my father just enjoyed your music so much. And actually, you came earlier when you had written your book and you signed your book for him. And he had on a fedora. My father always was the sharp dresser. And you said to him, I love that hat. I like that hat. <laughs> well, I appreciate hearing, hearing the story about your father. Rest in peace. Uh, oh, he's not I, resting. <laughs> I, like, I, like what you said. I like the three things you chose that they were doing. Telling lies his last, getting them drinks and whiskey. My dad is definitely up there with him doing, doing a little <laughs> embellishing. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're talking about us too. I hope I hope my dad is not talking about me because he's saying I wish that boy would shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think they're up there smiling. <laughs> I hope so. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, uh, Winston. I misspoke. We've actually got one more question um, <laughs> before we before we wind down, and it's from somebody you might know named Kenny Rampton. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about you in the marching band a little earlier, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> we can let Kenny, Kenny answer the question about do we play stuff perfectly? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> man, I just wanted to say hi, man. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. Yeah, you too, man. Thanks for doing all that you're doing, Winton. It's, it's inspiring to me, it's inspiring to my mom. She's watching these all the time, and it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Man, give my love to your mama. You know, she's out there for all of us, man. All the years of teaching, yeah. and you know, <laughs> we just oh, trying yeah. to follow in their footsteps, man. That's it, man. You know, that's it. Yeah, you heard about my story about marching band, huh? Well, I, he didn't tell me a story. I wanted to, he wanted to tell me something to compromise you, but he didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> all I can say is this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll talk to you tomorrow, man. Much, man, much love, man. Much love. Yes, sir. Likewise. Thanks, Kenny. All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Um, quickly to our supporters and donors. Um, we can't thank you enough. Jazz at Lincoln Center is a nonprofit organization in New York um, uh, committed to entertaining, enriching, and expanding a global community for jazz. If it's within your means, please consider making a donation. We're extraordinarily grateful for any support. Um, and with that, I'll just say stay safe out there. We hope to see you again for our upcoming live events. Um, thanks, Winton. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, you're right, Adam. Take care. Good night. night. Take care. Good night. Yes, indeed. Till we meet again.